Welcome to the Hardcore MBA Podcast with your host, Erland Bakke. Hi, today it's all about breathing. Michael Townsend Williams here on the call because he's come up with this really, really cool app which basically teaches us to breathe again. So why is breath so important? Um, I think that um, breathing is so important because it's um, if we didn't do it, we'd probably die, Erland. Yes, yes. It's important to breathe or else we would die. So how long can we go without breath? Cool. I can do a couple of minutes maybe. I'm not, I'm not a master of holding my breath really. Um, I mean, I think, was it David Blaine probably did a few minutes? Yeah. So, so um, without breath, we can survive very long. Food, we can do maybe like two or three weeks. Water, a couple of days. But breath yeah. is kind of important. I think, I think in a way, that, do you know those sort of um, athletic coaches who work on the sort of 1% thing of like, if you can just improve 1%, you know, every week, then that can really make a lot of difference. I think that's a similar thing with the, with the breath in the way that, we take it for granted and we don't realize that often we've got into bad habits and we're not doing it as well as we should do. And if we get that wrong, we're getting it wrong a few thousand times a day and that sort of cum- accumulates. And let's face it, we're not the least stressed we've ever been, are we? <laughs> it's interesting with the 1% as well because in sports, like uh, what separates like the number one golfer to f- not the best golfer in the world to the golfer in like 70 70- and the seventieth place is one percent. Typically, like it's like one yeah. percent better. Uh, it's just an interesting yeah. sort of percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess it, yeah. So I think because I I saw you speak at uh, Humanizing Tech here in London, and I was really really intrigued by your story. So I, I was thinking it would be really good to hear your story from the world of advertising up till sort of yeah. coming up with the app. Yeah, I guess, I mean, my journey probably started in the mid-80s where I worked at uh, an ad, ad agencies like Saatchi and Saatchi and Yoga and Rubicon, big um, multinational ad agencies. And at that time, I did one thing particularly well, Erland, and that, and that was to drink. So uh, I, I wasn't that good at advertising, but I was particularly good at drinking a lot. Um, and that was the way I managed stress. And I think you know, even now that's what a lot of people do to manage stress. And that became a problem for me. I, I was an alcoholic. Um, but I, I stopped drinking when my first son was born in 1995. Um, so I've been sober since then. Um, but, but that time um, made me realize that um, most of us don't manage stress very well. We, we, t- we tend to do, th- do things that exacerbate it. Um, rather than improve it um, and it wasn't really until um, uh, November the 2nd 1998 when I got a phone call in my swanky ad agency office that my younger brother had fallen from a 15th floor balcony and died on impact um, and I had a, a breakdown in my office and I suddenly thought that not only was I not dealing with stress very well I thought what the fuck am I doing with my life um, and I think that you know we can all do jobs that we don't particularly like and think about changing one day. Um, but when a tragedy happens, that's when you sort of really wake up and think, actually, life's short. Um, if I don't like this, I've got to make a change. Um, and I guess after that, I went through a very uncomfortable feeling. I was a recovering alcoholic. I was suffering from grief, depression, all of these sort of mental health things. Um, and really feeling very deeply uncomfortable about what I really wanted to do. And I had people, friends saying, you know, well, what are you really passionate about? What would you do if you, if you could do anything? And I didn't really know the answer to that because if you're an addict, you tend to uh, forget about those things. You know, you forget about your hobbies um, or the things that you really want to do with your life. So I was on a bit of a journey. I yoga, discovered yoga. Uh, I discovered breathing. I discovered all of these things that helped me deal with, with, with the, the anguish that I was going through, but still had no idea what I really wanted to do. And then um, I was uh, going to a yoga class and a yoga cl- uh, on a holiday uh, with my family and the yoga teacher didn't turn up and a little voice in my head said, hey, why don't you try and teach the class? And normally those little voices we very quickly squash down and ignore and this time I just opened my mouth and, and before I knew it, I was in the room, laying the mats down, lighting a candle and some incense and teaching yoga. And 
that's when I thought, wow, this is what I really like to do. So crazy as it might seem, I went from a, uh, from being an alcoholic ad man to, to a yoga teacher in 2002 and spent a few years really just teaching yoga, running workshops and retreats and um, going into this life of being rather than doing. So, so what is it about yoga that really works? Well, I think what yogis realized was that the, the, to have a successful life, you need to control your mind. And to control your mind, you need to control your energy. And to control your energy, you need to be able to control your breath. So although a lot of yoga nowadays is seen as this physical exercise and, and you're doing these contortions with your body, they were really just preparation um, for, for more advanced forms of yoga, which are basically breathing exercises around improving your physiology and your ability to control your mind. Um, so I guess if there's one thing that I really take from yoga into my work as an entrepreneur, it's that most people don't realize that, that advanced yoga is actually breathing, not, not doing stuff with your body. Um, and I want to now bring that sort of understanding to, to a wider audience of people that would never think about doing yoga, but do want to control their minds, do want to control their lives, and, and do want to be healthier and happier. So, yoga has, has many levels, and the activity itself is only one level out of... Yes. In Ashtanga, they teach eight levels of Yes. Of yoga. I'm sure there's varies, but yeah. I think the point is that it's more than just the physiology or the, the physical exercise. It's it's many levels of it. Yes, absolutely. And I think also it was that thing within within the mindfulness tradition that, that in classical mindfulness you just notice the breath. You're aware of the breath. Um, you don't try to change it. But what, where yogis were, were different was yogis realized that you needed to have control of your breath to, to go into d deeper levels of awareness. Um, so when I do my mindfulness work, you know, I bring you know, classical mindfulness traditions, but I also bring in some of the ancient yogic techniques. Um, because there are times when, you know, if you're in a stressed out state, being really deeply mindful and aware of it doesn't necessarily help. <laughs> you know, sometimes you need to intervene. <laughs> And I think knowing when to when, when to, to intervene and when to, to let things be, to know when to hold on and when to let go, um, these can seem to be paradoxical situations. And, and yoga is very um, skillful in in terms of a, 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 of teaching you how to cope with those paradoxes. I want to go back to? Uh, I'm just going to get my headset because I think there's some maybe my my phone my my computer is being a bit funny. Um, well, the computers, you know, they 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 like they like to mess about with us, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They have to laugh with us, really, Erland. <laughs> it's okay though. It's all good. Now I can wear these cool white headphones. Hey. Yeah. So, um, I have a question. So yesterday. Uh, yeah. was bank holiday Monday and I was going out with some some friends and I knew today I had like a 14 hour day ahead of me I was yeah. like I told them okay I'm gonna come but I'm not drinking yeah and then <laughs> uh, up until that's hard for a new region yeah it's it's uh, well it's hard for a lot of people <laughs> uh, I was just joking I used to have a, I used to have a friend at college at a new region um, uh, Runa Runa Lund Okay, you still you still uh, still in contact with him? Or? I'm not. I love to though. So if he's out there, Runa, give us a call. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, my question comes down to actually um, to alcohol, and um, so basically, oftentimes I don't. I, I say I'm not going to drink, and I don't drink. Like that's yeah. sort of nine out of ten times. Um, however, the people I was spending time with kind of go back to university where like it was a different environment and yes. that's sort of, so it's the same sort of clicky sort of, oh, let's, you know, let's get drunk kind of thing. Um, yeah. and so up until, so we met at three around eight thirty nine o'clock, I kind of had, I was like, okay, I'll have one white Russian, uh, <laughs> And then I, I didn't have that many. No, has only one right Russian, you know that. Yeah, yeah, they're too nice. Uh, and then, you know, and then the four or five beers extra. But my, uh, my question comes down to, 
Um, how do you not do that? Um, well, if I'm really honest, I think the first three years of, of, of not drinking, I got stoned every night. Okay. So, that, so that's, that, was, that was my gate, gateway. What's the opposite of gateway? If a gateway is into something, it should be a, the gate out drug. That was my gate out drug. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I got stoned for about two or three years, and then I realized it was making me depressed, and, and yoga took over. So, you, so that feeling when you finish work and you're feeling a bit tense and you want to sort of let go somehow, um, I just do like half an hour yoga, you know, breathing, stretching, relaxing. And once I've released that tension and stress, I feel fine. I feel like I've had a drink. I feel like I've had a joint. You know? So um, ultimately, you can do that with a few breaths because because uh, our, our physiology is designed to bring us back from a stressed place to uh, a happy place very quickly. It's just that we lose that knack, you know. And the common example I give is when you drop off a young child at a nursery when you're a parent, they scream and they go really stressed and they they hate you and it's really really um, uh, awful. And then, then you leave and you pop your head back at them about two seconds later and they're fine. Yeah, They've gone from really stressed to absolutely fine, playing with the Lego, happy as, uh, as they can be. And so our physiology is designed for us to get really stressed and fed up at work and then go, fine, I'm happy, I'm over that very quickly. But we lose that knack. We lose that knack. And so alcohol and all these things really are, are, are what we, could, we turn to instead because they're just more efficient. They're, they're faster ways to de-stress. One thing that I've noticed is like in TV shows, like in the media, oftentimes, you know, people say, oh, you look stressed. Do you want a, do you want a whiskey? Do you want a this? Do you want a that? Mm. It's, and, and that, of yeah. course, this is programming us to go, oh, I been feeling stressed. I should have a drink. And then we, yeah. then we program each other. Yeah, and then, and then also what happens is you get people that then work out when they're stressed, you know, so, so people go into the gym and they work out when they're stressed. That's fine, but um, the, the story I like to share really about this is a, is a running coach who worked with some um, runners in Africa, and he would send them on a, on a long-distance run in the morning. He would then tell them to rest all day and he'd do a second run in the evening. And when they rested in the day, they completely rested. They just lounged around and did nothing. And therefore, in the evening, they were ready for a second run and then totally nailed it. When, when the same coach worked with European athletes, they would go for a run in the morning. He'd say, rest. And you know what they'd do to rest? They'd go and play PlayStation. They'd watch films. They'd go shopping. They would do other stimulating things, and and the second run was always worse than the first. Mm -hmm. So I think our idea of what is rest, you know, has been so distorted that actually we don't ever give our, our bodies time to recover. And because we never do it, so for, for some clients that I have, they have three states really they're in. They're, they're either stressed, drunk, or asleep. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and if I get them relaxed or I do some breathing, they can't be relaxed without falling asleep because they're not used to being in a chilled space. And it's the same thing with people working. They, they, they get themselves into a state where the only way I can do my best work is if I get myself into a real state and there's a deadline and I'm really panicking and then I can nail it. And, they, and they, they, they con themselves into believing they need to be in that stress state to do their best work. And I just don't think it's true. So in terms of, of breath sync and, and using the app, so basically I started breath sync. using it. A couple, a couple, a couple of things. Uh, it's breathe sync, not breath sync. Breathe sync, yes. Breathe sync. And the measurement we have is WQ, not QW. Right, yes. Minor things, but yeah. Yes. So I started using it on uh, Wednesday, and I had a tennis match on, um, on Saturday. And I was actually yeah. using this during uh, points to, because um, it was a it was a challenging match, and I was trying to win, so I was I was trying to breathe as in uh, in the app, which I'm now yes. <laughs> um, breathe sync. That's right, right? Breathe <laughs> sync, uh, and I found it made me calmer. So actually, I was trying to breathe in between the points. In yeah. this way, and I and I did find that it gave me more sort of mental clarity in terms of winning the next point. 
I think that's really you're the, you're the first person who's actually shared that in-game experience. But but commonly, I'll talk about um, actually tennis players are trained in between points to breathe out more and to activate their recovery process so that they're recovering a little bit in between each point. Um, and, and a lot of athletes uh, are trained to do this. So that's great that you do that. I think also what you're doing there is as well as calming yourself down, you, you're improving your ability to stay in, in, in a focused place because the thing that, that we all suffer from in sports is when we, we, we get emotional, we get upset, and then when we get like that, we can't think clearly, we can't focus. Um, I mean, look at, look at the Arsenal, Arsenal centre-backs, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 how many times did Arsenal sort of lose games in the last few minutes of the, of the match when people just switch off? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I think that with, with breathing, what, what we wanted to do was to create something that you could use in a minute or two minutes in between meetings, in between doing stuff. But equally, you could also use it at the end of the day where you could lie down, put some headphones on and chill for five minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think training people to realize that that ability to um, get in sync can be used uh, before you go and do something challenging and also to recover from having done something challenging. So how long do you have to use it? Because oftentimes, uh, first of all, habitual ch changing habits is very hard, right? Yeah. So how long do you actually have to use the app to recover? Well, oh, hey, it's got, it's got a bit moody now cause, <laughs> cause because this is a very eco-friendly office I'm in. If yeah. you don't move around, the lights turn themselves off. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's cool. Well, that's maybe a good thing because if you're sitting too still, it makes you move. Yeah. It's like the Apple Watch. You know, yeah. It helps you to stand they up. Should, they should do that with computers, shouldn't they? If, if you sit behind your computer without moving for too long, the computer just turns off. <laughs> there we have the next app. Hey, absolutely. Um, for, for me, I think that um, there's two ways of answering this. There's a sort of research-based thing which would say that actually um, slow controlled breathing for three minutes three times a day shows a significant improvement in people's physiology, reducing blood pressure and all these things. So from a research point of view, you want to aim for like three times three minutes a day. Um, and there are people that do these things for even longer periods of time. I think a lot of mindfulness research is, is based on people practicing for 20 minutes a day. That said, in, in my own experience of things, you have to make the first step really, really easy. So for me, I'd say even if you did a breathe sync for one minute a day, it has value because you're training yourself in what a healthy breathing rhythm is for you. You're getting an indication of your well-being level. So actually, if you're overcooking it and you need to take it easy, it's going to tell you. So starting with one minute a day, you know, can't be sniffed at. Um, also realizing that, you know, if you're in between, say, two meetings, if you use that minute and it gets you back in a good place, that can have a significant difference and outcome to your next meeting. Or in a relationship, if, you, if when you come home uh, and you're feeling really ratty and stressed out and you spend two minutes de-stressing with breathing and then don't have that argument, don't shout at the kids, that can have a massive impact too. So I think that, that this is not just about the sort of the deep phys physiological change that you can have. It's also about a number of other things that come out of you being able to control yourself a little bit better. One of the things that a coach taught me once was to, you know, he asked me, um, she asked me actually, uh, what can you do? So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't have time. Well, yeah. do you have time when you're on the bus? Do you have time maybe before a tennis match? Do you have time, you know, yeah. when you're just uh, having a cup of tea? Um, yeah. So we do have time. We just need to find the time. Yeah, and I think that one of the one of the clever things about what we've designed with BreatheSync is that people want to know the number. They want to know their WQ because actually it's a really interesting metric. Some people say it's it's associated with it's, it's, it comes out of heart rate variability. If anyone has heard that term, but heart rate variability is connected with longevity of life, a number of other things. Eighty four average, that's okay. But if we if we, if we want to show off our BreatheSync scores. Um, What's your average? My average is 92 at the moment, which considering I'm in the middle of fundraising, yeah. it's not bad, is it, really? So, so is that like your weekly average? or? That, well, that's my um, running average. Okay. Um, okay. 
But I think that, um, I mean, interestingly for me, actually, with at the moment, is that I have been under stress. I mean, the number being high doesn't mean that you're deeply relaxed. It means that you're just able to cope with stress. So you might be, you know, in a very challenging time of your life, but you can maintain a high level if at the same time as having that challenge, you're maintaining a vagal, what we call vagal tone. So your body has the ability to, to, to manage and handle that stress. So it doesn't mean, you know, having a high number doesn't mean that you're flat on your back, chilling and not doing anything. So what I, what I, really, what I really love about uh, breathe sync is um, you know getting you, you put your finger here on the camera and then you, yeah. you're instantly getting your heartbeat and it helps you breathe and then you get like instant feedback with the points your your WQ yes. which I, I I love that about breathe sync it's 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 I've I've used a lot of different types of apps okay yes. and um, for for quite a few years I was using a pranayana app. Yes, um, which was fine, but it was like you got to sit a certain way, and you got to sort of breathe yeah. with it very loudly, and it, it was it was just very complicated um, to use. Yeah. And the same with Heart Math, which is another uh, you know app. Um, and uh, what I really really like about this is how you don't have to plug anything in; it's just there, and you get yeah. instant feedback, and you get your instant score, and it's kind of fun. Like today, I had one hundred and thirteen, which is my record so far right. um, yeah. I, I don't know why I, but <laughs> I, th I think I think an important point here actually is that HeartMath a great company but they came out of um, you know a, a black box designed to work with a PC but a software so so they, they, they come from a you know sitting in an office you know doing something for 15 20 minutes with a box um, you mentioned who else did you mention uh, the Pranayama app yeah. that really is um, taking something that would be a normal form of pranayama training in the real world and making an app out of it. Same thing with people like Headspace and Calm, that they're taking what you did in the real world, taking audio and video or timing things and put it into an app. What I wanted to do uh, when we worked on BreatheSync was create something that was actually designed around how we use um, mobile phones. So it comes from the reality of, of a mobile user's life rather than something that existed elsewhere that's been forced into this new um, dynamic. And, and for me, what I notice with the apps that I like to use is I like things that I can pick it up, it's very clear what happens, I do it, I get out, and then I get on with my life or, or whatever else it is. You know, I don't want something that's going to try and drag me into a world that, I'm not, that I don't want. And also, I wanted something that really couldn't have existed before now. I mean, you know, it's only now that the cameras are so good on phones that you can pick up someone's heart rate through the finger. Um, we're the first people in, in the world that actually create a breathing rhythm based on live heart data. Heart math don't do that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. they don't, they're, they're, their breathing rhythms aren't responding to your heart like we do. Mm -hmm. um, to give you uh, that sort of number, that WQ number, there, there are people doing very complicated bits of analysis to get similar numbers. Um, but wouldn't it be great if we could get the world's average WQ by a few million people doing something for one minute on their phones? Mm -hmm. so, so for me, it's designed about the reality of our lives. And if that then becomes you know, a gateway into taking people on a journey of improving their well-being, whether that's sleeping more, exercising more, eating better, you know, having better relationships, all of these other things that, 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 that are part of a successful life, um, that's our mission, you know. It, it, it's it's and, and breathing is, is. I mean, the, the quote that I think um, I might have used when, when we when we last met was a quote from a guy called Dr. Alan Watkins, which is, "Breathing creates the platform of which everything else is built: health, happiness, cognitive ability, elevated performance, success, and influence." So, you know, if you get your breathing right, it can have a massive impact on a number of areas of your uh, other areas of your life. And you talk about babies in terms of learning how to breathe, because babies, yeah. they do this naturally. Um, can you just talk yeah. us through how to breathe uh, naturally? Yes, yeah. so, so this is something that we don't really point to uh, explicitly in the app at the moment, but we will do it in the new version that, that we're raising funds for, uh, it is that for me, the breathing technique is, is not a technique. It's really about taking you back to your natural state. And obviously, babies and young children, you know, they are in their natural state a lot more than us. 
And babies breathe naturally from the belly because it's more efficient, yeah? I mean, if you breathe from your diaphragm, you get, you know, it's 20% more efficient than breathing from your chest. They breathe in and out through their nose because the nose is designed for breathing. Little hairs clean out the dust particles. A chamber behind the nose warms the air to a nice temperature. And they know that breathing out is where they trigger the body's natural relaxation response and then they feel chilled. So for me, you know, babies are the best breathers. And I love the idea that, that in this world where everyone's looking for experts and academics and clever people to tell them what to do, that we actually just follow the um, follow a baby, breathe like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I, I just had a nephew, and uh, I was actually looking at his stomach and how he was breathing, yeah. you know, through his stomach, like up and down. And it's, yeah. I was like, that's a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, but 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 it's it's amazing how um, when you relearn that as an adult. It's almost like, wow, I didn't realize that conscious breathing could actually have this much impact on me. Mm-hmm. So once, once you've rediscovered that relationship with your breath and your breath can actually change how you feel very quickly, it's with you all the time. It's free <laughs> as long as you can remember to use it. And this is where, again, another part where BreatheSync comes in, I guess, is it's trying to make it engaging and fun to reconnect to your breath. Because unfortunately, as human beings, we don't like simple answers. You know, if someone says, you know, you're stressed, breathe, we go, oh, yeah, I know. Well, you know, they'll just forget it. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So as a marketeer, we, we, we need, and a product designer, we need to, to create hooks and ways of really helping people make positive habit change. And let's be honest about it. Most of the people in the world that are working on habit change aren't doing it for our betterment. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that, that, that most pe- people that, that abuse our habit systems, our, 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 our own reward system, they do it to sell caffeine, sugar, alcohol, you know, games, shoes, whatever it might be. Um, you know, they're not doing it because it makes us healthier and happier. They're doing it because it makes them more money. Would you say that the world of advertising uses the sort of seven, the, the seven destinies to sell? Greed, envy, pride. Absolutely. Advertising will use any, any trick it can. You know, I mean, obviously the biggest ones are sex and money. Yeah. Yeah. Sex and money is what it tends to be about. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, when I do my coaching work and I work with, you know, people that have a lot of money, but they're not happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and happiness doesn't come from money as we know it, it comes from um, well I think that the work that was done with the New Economics Foundation is very interesting the five ways of well-being and, and they did some research around the world into what was really genuinely making people happy and it was connecting to people meaningful connections to people being active noticing more, learning and giving Yeah, they, they met, those, those sort of things make you happy not money so, so if I can be in any small part, part of that movement saying to people, let, let, let's improve our health and our happiness and our well-being um, because money really uh, doesn't make you happy. So definitely one of the things that I love with the app is how simple it is to use. Uh, you know, you, just, you open it up and, and off you go. It's, it's amazing. When is it coming for, for Android? Um, there's, there's a, well, now it's only well, for iPhone. When, when is it yeah, it's only for iPhone at the moment. And, uh, and the plan, the plan is, is, is to build a new version of the app, which will be available on iPhone and Android. And we'd like to get that out by, by the end of this year. Um, so if we, we've got a fund, crowdfunding campaign, which um, will be live on Crowdcube probably about mid-June. And if we hit our target there, then we'll have it on Android by the end of the year. Fantastic. Fantastic. And Crowdcube is, is a London-based uh, crowdfunding Crowdcube platform. Is, yeah, Crowdcube is, is the world's largest equity crowdfunding platform, and it's based in the UK. Um, and at the moment on the BreatheSync site, if you go to breathesync.com slash invest, there's a, a page where you can register an interest in, in being part of, of uh, this tribe. That is trying to get the world breathing better. So when you invest on Crowdcube, do you actually then own a percentage of the business? You get a percentage of the business. Also, you will get access to an investor-only theme. So we're going to be creating themes and lots of great stuff around the app. The app at the moment is very much a core product. We're going to be creating some investor stuff um, that only you will get access to as well. So as well as having a share in the business, you'll also have 
uh, um, exclusive access to some really, really cool things in the app. So what would you say is really the sort of global potential or potential in the UK? I'm not sure where you guys are focusing. Is it global or UK? It's global. I think, I think that, that, that our marketing spend to start with will be focused on the UK. Um, I also think that you know, Scandinavia and Northern Europe are places that we would focus on in the, in the first year. Uh, ultimately, everywhere. I mean, we, we, we did a free promo um, for some students in Bath last week, um, and one of them shared it with, in China, and we had 189 downloads in China. Mm -hmm. So obviously, there's a few bit more million there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would like it to be a truly global business, you know, um, where where headspace meets Strava, you know, where, where mindfulness meets fitness, where wellness becomes, you know, maybe a little bit higher up people's agenda. Fantastic. So uh, the crowdfunding is going live mid-June, and when you invest yep. there, you, I will actually own a percentage of uh, Absolutely. Brutus. Yeah. yeah, you will own a percentage, and you will be in at the beginning – so it's the first round of funding. It's you know it's the first round of funding we've done. We've been bootstrapping up until now. So yeah, I would I would love not only um, you to breathe yourself better, but you helping the world breathe better, and you might make a little bit of money as well. And how many how many downloads and users do you guys currently have? Um... We have over twenty thousand uh, downloads so far. Um, we haven't really been marketing in the last year. We've been trying to build the business case and raise money. Um, but we're, we're looking to reach about 100,000 um, downloads in the next six months once we've got the new version out. And will you start asking for people's account information, uh, basically? Because when I lo download it now, you just open up the app and you use it straight away. Uh, yeah. Are you going to get start getting people's emails? And, and is, that, is that being built into the new platform? Yeah. At the, at the moment, we don't hold any user information at all. So it's all on the app. Um, and we're looking at that. I mean, I think that the model that we'll follow will, will be some form of subscription model, a freemium model. And, and we do think that there is benefits in having access to user data to give them insights. But we want it to be uh, for and on behalf of the, the, the customer and the user and not for someone else. So we're not interested in making money from people's data. Um, we want to fully respect um, their privacy. Um, and we want, we want to use that data to, to, to make political points as well. So if we can say things like the average WQ in London today is lower than it is in Berlin, um, and then use that to make a point about the stress of workers in London, then I think that that's really powerful stuff. So, so I'm more interested in using an anonymized um, uh, user data to make, to, to make an improvement in people's well-being than I am in terms of selling it to health insurance companies. <laughs> Uh, when you gave your talk, you talked about the chief wellness officer. Um, yeah. So basically, in a company, we you know you know got a CEO, CFO, COO, whatever. But you want to have a, C, a chief wellness officer. Tell us about that concept. Yeah, or, or, or chief well-being officer. I mean, um, is that is well-being okay? Yeah, I, I like well-being. Some people like wellness, but chief chief well-being officer. I think well. I do quite a few talks, and I, I'm always amazed how, at the moment, if you run a big business, um, it's perfectly acceptable for you to stand up and say that um, profits are down this quarter because we've invested in plant and machinery. But if you get up and say profits are down this month because we've invested in our staff's well-being, people would laugh at you. Mm -hmm. And it just seems ridiculous to me that, that, that the well-being of a piece of metal is more important to some companies than the well-being of their greatest asset, which is their people. And I think for too long, you know, human resources um, departments, you know, they've been the poor cousin. You know, they've been, they, they haven't been at the forefront of, of businesses, even when they are around people. And let's be honest about it. If you're in a creative business or an innovation business or technology business, if your staff are well, they will be productive. You know, they will come up with great ideas. They will make the business a great business. So I, I just want to put it out there as a challenge you know, to companies that if you talk about well-being, then have a chief well-being officer because every single big multinational talks about the well-being of their staff, but none of them have a chief well-being officer. So if it's that important to you, here, there's the challenge. <laughs> so um, what kind of things could we implement 
as entrepreneurs, if we have staff, let's say in the morning, in the, in the sort of midday and afternoon, what kind of what kind of things? Of course, uh, using BreatheSync, um, oh, other things. Well, well, I think you know, with BreatheSync, particularly when we get the new version and we can give companies a dashboard of of the numbers, it gives you a metric so that you know whether what you're doing is making a difference. So I think if, you, if you've got an average WQ in the company, you can have a challenge as a team or a company, let's get that WQ up higher. What can we do about it? And I would start by having a conversation. So start with having a conversation. If you haven't got a chief well-being officer, maybe you appoint someone for three months and it's a rolling position because it gives someone responsibility. Open up the dialogue about how do people feel? When do, when, do you, when do you work your best? I know for me that actually six to nine in the morning is my best time. Yeah? It's actually outside of most companies' working hours. <laughs> right? um, so, so when do you work your best? Um, when do you want some flexibility? Um, you know, if, you are, um, if you're not sleeping very well, what can, what, what, what can we do about that? Um, food and diet, you know, um, what can we do to help you with, with that? Um, are we wasting time in meetings at work when, when actually sometimes you need to be on your own to work? I think one of the problems with all the open plan stuff is that sometimes people just need their own space to do their own thing. So um, have conversations. I mean I, I mean, I can come up with lots of ideas of what I think you should do. I think once it's a cultural thing that this is important to you as, as an organization that you talk about it, you go have walking meetings, um, you know, and you've got it. You've got a measurement from breathing. If that measurement isn't going up, isn't being looked after, then sit down, have a talk about it. You know, is there something we can do differently? I, I like I like ideas. Like I think one, one of the Google, um, maybe it was Google Ventures, have a thing where they're holding anxiety parties where where workers could get together and talk about their anxieties and their worries. And often they realised in those conversations that the things that they were worrying about were really silly and they didn't need to worry about them in the first place. <laughs> so, so don't underestimate the power of conversation about these things. Um, show some real commitment by saying, actually, we're going to put a number against this and, and, and we're going to reward people that, you know, that move that number higher. I mean, for our, I know for us as a business at BreatheSync, that when, when we're funded, um, not only will profit be a motive, but we want to increase the average WQ of our customers. You know, that, um, we, um, because we've got that number, we know whether we're doing a good job or not. Fantastic. Um, and you've also written a book. Would you like to tell us about your book? Yeah. Have I got a copy of my book? Um, I have got a copy of my book here. Mm -hmm. It's Do Breathe, Calm Your Mind, Find Focus, Get Stuff Done. And this book was published by the Do Book Company um, that come out of a thing called the Do Lectures. So the Do Lectures, which is a great site that you should check out, thedolectures.com, um, where they have people from around the world talking about things that they're passionate about. And the book really is about bringing, the bringing together these two worlds of well-being and productivity. I think for all too long, I thought that if I looked after myself, I would sacrifice um, what I could do with my life. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that, that as, I've, as I've matured maybe or, or, or got a little bit wiser, I realized these two things feed off each other. So you need to challenge yourself. You need to have things that, that, that you're passionate about, but also you need to look after your well-being. Uh, and these two things, I mean, the, the chapters in the book cover things like energy, mindfulness, focus, flow, habits, courage. Um, so it bounces around areas. So sometimes you'll read a chapter, it'll make you feel cozy and comfortable and relaxed. And another cha chapter will make you feel challenged and out of your comfort zone and, and, and questioning. Um, but, but, but people seem to like it. It's on its third print. Um, it's, it, you can buy it um, from the publisher, Do Book Company, or Amazon, Foils, Waterstones, lots of different places have it. Um, uh, and I think it's useful. I mean, it, it's really focused about getting you to do stuff, you know, not just read about it and talk about it, but actually get, get out there uh, and actually make a difference. So when so, you say uh, doing, why is doing... Because oftentimes we'll we'll sit and we'll think about things, we'll be anxious about something, but then oftentimes when you then just go and do it, it becomes easier and less fearful. Um, yeah. What's yeah. the concept behind the sort of the doing rather than the alternative? Well, well I guess um, we we live in a society where that we think sometimes by uh, having a health club membership we're going to get fit. Or, or by watching a cookery program, we're going to be a great chef. 
So we sort of live this sort of vicarious life where where we've lost touch with 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 what we know as a child, which is that you know you learn through doing. Yeah, you do something doesn't work, you do it differently. It does work, you do it again. Um, and so uh, I think we've got out of out of touch with that. We've also got out of touch with phone calls. I mean, like my son, you know, just come out of uni. Um, for him, making a phone call is heavy. Yeah. Yeah. If I tell him to call someone, it's like I can feel the sweat on his hands because it's like it's not something he does a lot. Yeah. So, so, so that first step from zero to one, when you decide I'm actually going to do something, you obviously hit lots of inertia. You hit the fear, fear of doing it wrong or failing, the, 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 the fear that it's the wrong thing to do. Um, there's lots. I mean, there's a guy, Hugh Laurie, an actor, and he talks about, you know, the thing that stops us from doing is we want to do things when we're ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we're doing, we're ready. It's the right thing. We're perfectly prepared, and the truth is, we're never ready. Yeah, we're never ready. Things and timing is never ideal or perfect. Yeah. Um, so when you get used to just doing stuff and, and seeing what happens, and then responding to that, um, you know, it's a little bit unsettling at first because you are. It is a little bit uncomfortable, but but ultimately, you start feeling more alive by doing it. Um, and as long as as long as you you balance that um, with periods of not doing, you know, I mean, there are people that then then take this to the extreme, and they're always busy, and they're always doing stuff, and actually they they're doing stuff to avoid the pain of not doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there can be fear about not doing as well. You yeah, know? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. they're very busy, so, but they're not doing what's really important. Yeah. Absolutely, they they're, they're avoiding they're avoiding the the, the, the things. Um, so yeah, just start. I mean, I mean, I mean if you go to um, uh, my my blog uh, on the Stillworks site, which I think you can actually link to from BreatheSync, mm -hmm. um, there's a, a post um, called Start with a guy called Z Frank. Do you know Z Frank? Yeah, the Dutch yeah, yeah, guy? yeah, yeah, yeah. He used yeah, to make these um, videos, crazy. right? Yeah, there's a great video he's got about called Start. Okay. Um, and that's what I would watch. If you if you if you if, you, if you're procrastinating, if you if you want to do something but you can't quite get that first thing started. But watch Start by uh, Z Frank, and also go to the Do Lectures. The Do Lectures is a great site for 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 people sharing that problem about getting going on things. Mm -hmm. um, David Hyatt, the founder, um, speaks very eloquently about the the, the importance of, of just making that first step, getting started, moving into the unknown. Um, uh, yeah. One one challenge that I have is because um, I value my time. Right, so I value my time. So I will look at something and I'll go, "Oh, is it is it worth my time?" And I'll look at something yeah. else and I'll try to sort of balance out, you know, what I should do based on the value that I will get out of it. Okay, yes. um, which kind of in a way ruins the experience. It's like sitting down and uh, on a Friday night or Sunday evening. Uh, and saying, oh, I want to watch a really good movie. And then yeah. you have all these movies, and you're like, oh, that could be good, and that could be good. And so the paradox of choice is yeah. something that uh, I find challenging. Um, any suggestions well, well, there? Well, well, I, well, I think that the, the thing about value is you don't really ever know what doing something will result in. So in yoga, we have a concept called karma yoga, where you focus on acting to the best of your ability but realizing that you don't have any control over the consequences or the fruits of that action yeah mm -hmm. you can only act in the moment to the best of your ability where that takes you you don't really know so when you're making those those judgment calls on value it's it's very flaky for me i mean when i think with breathe sync i spent years on breathe sync with with my co-founder simon um wasting a lot of time uh, playing around with ideas that if I'd been very logical and rational about it, it would have been a waste of time. Yeah, it would have been a waste of money. It wouldn't have been a good thing to do. But because we got into that playful place, I think we created a thing of beauty that we wouldn't have done if we put that pressure on ourselves. Right. Sometimes I think that if you are too sure about your ability to judge things, you can miss new things that pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can do the wrong thing, but it ends up being the right thing. 
I mean, Steve Jobs explains this perfectly well in his um, Stanford address, where he talks about um, you know walking into like a, a lecture on topography um, when he had no idea about it, and that actually became a very important design principle in the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. But he says you can only join the dots up looking back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you might be making a move that doesn't seem to have any value, but actually in 10 years' time was the most valuable thing that you ever did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so do based on doing, and when you do it, just make the most well, out of the well, doing. I think there's a gut feel. I mean, we call it gut feel or intuition. Sometimes something just feels right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, your yeah. rational, logical brain can explain to you all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. Um, but, but it's learning to, to, to have a relationship with that other voice that just knows or just feels or, or just yearns to take you off somewhere. And, and like, you know, we call that your heart, you know, follow your heart. Mm -hmm. Following your heart is not a safe, logical, rational thing. It's just something that you do because it just feels right. Yeah. And yeah. we live in a world where we don't trust our feelings. You know, we trust thoughts, which is pretty crazy when you think how flitty they are. <laughs> um, but we trust thoughts and we don't trust feelings. So um, where do you kind of picture yourself in the business in about sort of three to four or five years time? Three to four years time, I would love to be um, fl flying around the world, um, getting people breathing, getting people excited about it, um, global numbers of WQ being important to governments and companies, um, and just evangelizing about um, the power of the breath um, to improve our health. And, and sharing that with as many people as I can. So, so yeah, I guess it would be a global business. You know, I'd like to have, see... Um, Breathe sync. It's already in a hundred countries, but I'd like all of those hundred countries to have, you know, quite a lot of people doing it. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, let's talk a little bit about the other things because you do coaching. You go into companies. Yeah. You help companies. Uh, so the app is is one part of many things. Yeah. So, that so, you do. Yeah, so, so the app was a, was a side project um, and is not how I earn my living at the moment. So I earn my living um, doing productivity coaching running mindfulness courses. I still teach yoga. I, st I teach yoga um, in a couple of companies, um, the Tate Britain, the National Portrait Gallery, and I teach in my hometown. I have my book, so I do talks, and I do workshops around the book. But when I was pushed um, by a coach I was working with in Ireland about four years ago, and we're talking about all the things, different things I did, he said, you know, if there was one thing you could do, what would it be? And it was to teach the world to breathe better. Because, you know, Breathing is behind everything that I do, whether it's you know, learning how to improve your productivity, your well-being. Um, it's at the heart of it. Um, but, but I think it's you know, the, the, my vision for BreatheSync is a, as a community. It's a community of people not looking after their well-being just to feel well. It's that they're looking after their well-being so that they can then go and create great things with their lives. You know? So it's that combination of feeling well but then doing well at the same time. So uh, such a simple thing that we all have access to. If the whole world just kind of br uh, spend a bit, little bit more time breathing correctly, everybody would be more calm. They would, we would make better decisions. There'd be less conflict. Because yeah. um, yeah. we, when we're aggressive or we're in a stressed situation, we make, as you said earlier, bad choices. You know, we drink alcohol, yeah. we fight each other. We, you know, but if we learn how to be calmer in these situations, then there's less violence and everybody, and the more collaboration and communication in the world, the better. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. So guys, go to breathesync.com or stillworks.org to learn more about Michael and his amazing, amazing software. And also go to uh, Crowdcube um, where you can invest in the company um, it's an amazing app. I love it. I've been using it now. It, it's helped me uh, play better tennis. And, uh, you know, during the day now, when I, if I start feeling um, too excited or stressed about something, um, I do use it. And uh, I just love getting that instant feedback. 
So, uh, Michael, thank you so much for, uh, for being on the show. Sure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by MrOutsource.com. Outsourcing to the Philippines done for you. Mr. Outsource is a recruitment company matching busy entrepreneurs with Filipino virtual assistants. So you can have the time to focus on what's important.